All right, this is going to be a quick recap on predation and all the steps that are involved. First off, remember that typically we think of predation events as being just killing. One individual kills and consumes another, and it happens pretty quickly, like this bat swooping into the moth. What I want to argue is that predation is actually a function of several different discrete steps where the predator, if they're going to be successful, has to do all of these things, and the prey, if they're going to be successful, they need to keep the predator from doing all these things. So what I'm going to do is just briefly run through all of these steps, and then I will post the videos that I reference in here as links on the Moodle page. First off, and this is one that we covered in class, is that if you're going to be a predator, you need to be active at the time that your prey item is active. So if you are a nocturnal predator, then your prey will have to be nocturnal. And if you're a prey item that is active in the daytime or diurnally, then you're going to be subject to predators, daytime predators, attacking you. And recall that there are lots of prey adaptations for decreasing encounter rates and lots of predator adaptations for increasing encounter rates. For example, with the zooplankton, they migrate vertically in the water column and the individuals that do that avoid being consumed by visual predators. The next step is detection. And remember that if you're a successful prey item, you will detect your predator before they detect you. If you're a successful predator, then you're very good at detecting your prey. So the adaptation here is that the predator has very good vision. They can detect prey from a long ways away, over a thousand feet in the case of this eagle. And this prey item has eyes on the side of its head and ears that it can rotate so that it can detect the predator as it's approaching. Here is an adult dragonfly and they have eyes that are both predator-like and prey-like. They're prey-like in that their eyes can see almost 360 degrees in all directions around their body so they can see a predator, like a bird, coming to attack them. But they're also predator-like in that they can see their prey item, typically other small flying insects like mosquitoes. If you're a prey item, one of the ways that you can avoid being detected by predators is to hide really well or to be camouflaged. Another word for this is crypsis. So these are cryptic prey. And there are several prey shown here. There's a lichen grasshopper. There's a flounder that blends in very well with its background. There's a moth that matches the substrate that it rests on. Here's a caterpillar, a seahorse, a katydid, which is like a grasshopper that feeds in trees another moth that looks like dead leaves, and finally a plant hopper that looks a little bit like a thorn on a rose bush. So these are all camouflaged. They avoid being detected because they are good at hiding. Another strategy if you're a prey item to avoid detection is to be aposematically or warningly colored. There are lots of examples here and you can bet that all of these species are toxic or venomous or dangerous in one way or another. They either sequester poisons from the foods that they eat, or they manufacture their own poisons. Here's an example of a bunch of other prey items or potential prey items that don't even look like prey items to predators because they are aposematically colored. They warn the predator, eat me and you're going to regret it. Mimicry is a special kind of aposematic coloration. So on the left hand side we've got a moth that looks very much like a wasp or a hornet and it's not defended at all. But the thing that it's mimicking, the model down below here, is venomous or dangerous or unpleasant to touch or try to capture. Batesian mimicry is a case of a mimic that is palatable or undefended looking like a model which is not palatable or is defended or is dangerous. In other words, is episomatically colored and can back it up. In the case of Mullerian mimicry, something named after a guy named Mueller, both species involved sort of mimic each other. There is no true model because they're essentially both models. They're both toxic, they're both defended in their own way, and there's an advantage to both species to look like other species that are toxic and defended. Here's an example that I talked about briefly in class of caterpillars that either look like snakes or bird poop. That's pretty good mimicry. None of them are really actually defended, 
So these are cases of Batesian mimicry. There are lots of cool examples of aposematic coloration, only a few examples of aposematic acoustics, as indicated by these moths. In this case, the moth makes a sound that warns the bat, eat me and you're going to regret it. And sure enough, as you'll see in the videos, bats that approach these moths quickly turn away right before they consume them. These moths sequester toxins from the plants that they eat when they are caterpillars, and so they are defended, and they use aposematic acoustics to warn their predators. Lots of species mimic other species, and we're discovering examples of these sorts of things all the time. There's the recently named and discovered Ligodium spider moth, which sort of looks like a spider, at least if you look at it in a white background. And then there's also this moth in the middle that looks a lot like a spider displaying. Look at the videos under Metal Mark Moth and Spider, and you'll see that these spiders actually think that these moths are displaying aggressive spiders. That's a pretty good defense if you're a moth. The next step in the sequence if you're a predator is that you have to successfully approach your prey. Prairie dogs combat this and so do meerkats and other social animals where some individuals look out for the approaching predators. When the predator approaches, these prairie dogs will make some sort of sound that alerts other members. One way that some animals who are predators get away from this is they have approaches that are very stealthy. For example, owl wings cannot be heard, and so as they are approaching their prey, typically at night, the prey can't hear them. They also can't see them because they're owls, so they're active at night. The next step in the sequence is that predators have to successfully capture their prey. And anytime you see sharp talons or sharp teeth or big claws, you can be sure that these are capture adaptations. But there are lots of other interesting capture adaptations as well. Check out the videos for this sling-jawed wrasse, this fish that can extend its jaw, or bola spiders, which capture their prey by spinning a special silk attached to the end of a long strand, and that sticky silk latches on to prey as they throw it at the prey. Finally, in this slide, cool capture adaptations from antlions enable them to capture prey items like small insects, such as ants, and then drag them under and suck them dry. Dragonflies and damselflies are voracious predators, both as adults and, as pictured here, as larvae. And there's a great video on the Moodle page showing these larvae attacking mosquitoes who are their prey in aquatic environments. Some plants are predaceous as well, and these plants also have capture adaptations. On the right, you see a pitcher plant that has these recurved spine-like structures that keep insects captured into the tank and redirects them back into the tank where the plant can digest them. Some species of pitcher plants even have these glow-in-the-dark UV lights that they produce that enable them to capture more insects than if they didn't have those lights. Some of the species we have around here have these lights. Awesome! Many prey species have anti-capture adaptations that are used to combat the capture adaptations of the predators. I'll post a few of these videos online. One of them is kind of a just-so story that shows this horned lizard, both with the really long pointy horns which keeps predators from attacking them and capturing them, but also the, have the ability to squirt blood from their eyes. I'm not exactly sure how this is an anti-capture adaptation, but whatever, that's the story. Bombardier beetles, shown in the center here, have great anti-capture adaptations. They mix together two precursor chemicals, and what comes out is a boiling hot spray. As you'll see in the video that's on the Moodle page, this can be very hot and very effective. Several species of ants in the family Formicidae have formic acid that they can release through these little stingers. In fact, fire ants are members of the Formicidae. So if you've ever been stung by a fire ant, you know what formic acid feels like. That's a pretty effective anti-capture adaptation. If you're a predator, you do not want to mess with them. Caterpillars have lots of anti-capture adaptations, and I'll show you a couple of those videos on the Moodle page as well. One of them is that fling themselves about and vomit all over themselves. That way, if a predator tastes the gut contents of a caterpillar, the chances are that that predator will leave them alone. 
The next step in successful predation from a predator standpoint is you have to get that food into your gut. Flamingos have predator handling adaptations as part of their beaks that allow them to sift through loads and loads of mud and capture small aquatic invertebrates that are down in the sediment. Large fangs on predators like cats and dogs use their very sharp teeth to be able to handle that prey item as you'll see here in the bottom picture where a bobcat is handling that prey. Now the prey isn't dead yet but it's probably about to be. Prey have lots of adaptations to keep from being handled into the mouth of the predator. One really cool adaptation that some prey have is shown here with tail autotomy. If you grab a skink, which is a kind of a lizard, just by the tail, it has the ability to just pop off that tail. That tail keeps wriggling and the predator's attention is drawn to the wiggling tail and then the skink runs away. This is a pretty effective anti-handling adaptation. Butterflies and moths both have scales on their wings and these scales make them a little bit slippery. Notice that there's a little chunk taken out of the hind wing of this little butterfly. What often happens is that predators grab the wings and before they can get the prey item into their mouth, that wings break off or the slippery scales get loosed and the predator loses track of that prey item. One more anti-handling adaptation here shown in the Pacific hagfish. This is a fish, even though it doesn't have typical fins that you might think of with fish. One cool adaptation that it has is that as soon as it gets captured by a predator, they exude huge amounts of slime. Now, The slime is so copious that it blocks the mouths of fish, makes the fish let them go, and the hagfish goes off to swim and live another day. Now if you're a predator, what you need to do next is consume that prey. You need to get it into your gut. You've handled it, now you've got to turn it into food. Toads, as potential prey items, can puff themselves up, and this is thought to keep the predator from being able to consume that prey item. Of course, until the toad is dead, and it can no longer keep itself puffed up. The shearing teeth of predators, shown here in this photo as the fourth premolar and the first molar, on the lower mandible, shear together like scissors. And in the photo of the lion down below, you see that it is chewing on the side of its mouth. Those teeth slice against each other and shear off pieces of meat that can then be swallowed. These are consumption adaptations that many mammalian predators have. Okay, so here's the final step. If you're a predator, you've gone through all of the other steps. You've captured, approached, and handled, and consumed, but if you can't turn that prey item into offspring, then that whole process isn't worth it at all. Imagine eating a piece of notebook paper. Sure, you can capture and handle and consume it, but it doesn't cause you to gain weight at all, it doesn't allow you to make any more offspring, then that's not food. That wasn't a successful predation event. So from a predator standpoint, you have to increase your fitness by actually consuming food and turning it into biomass mass of predator and eventually babies. Now if you're a prey item what you have to do is keep that predator from converting you into offspring. How these monarch caterpillars and adults do it is they've got loads of cardiac glycosides. These are defensive chemicals that stop sodium ATPase pumps. Because of that they can stop the heart rate of the predator if they can consume enough of them. Now these toxins are also emetic which means that they make the predator throw up. What you're seeing here is a naive blue jay that has just consumed a monarch butterfly and soon afterwards they just throw them back up again. That was not a successful predation event for that blue jay. So remember the sequence of successful predation from a predator standpoint is encountering, detecting, approaching, capturing, handling, consumption, and conversion into offspring. Remember from the beginning that we typically think of predation as just killing and eating. But we haven't talked about killing specifically in this process at all. So where do you imagine killing happens? And why don't you think it requires a separate step in this equation? Okay, you have enough information now to be able to complete your assignment. Look for the instructions on the Moodle page. See you in class.